Hey, don't forget to bring the cat inside. So we don't forget. Patty, are you going to run the slideshow? I can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. If you don't have a microphone, if you just put into your library, your name and your library name in the chat, we can make sure to get you credit. And who is the phone number 785-243-1859? Sue Gustafson from uh, Frank Carlson Library in Concordia. Thank you, Sue. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. <clears> hey. <throat> okay. We have a few more people joining us, but we are just past the hour. Hey, did you want me to record to my computer or the cloud? Um, usually I do computer, but if you do the cloud, we can still access it. So okay. whichever is fine. I did it to the cloud. So okay. there we go. And it just dawned on me that I don't think I've done it that way before. Connie <laughs> from Agra, can you tell us who's joining you this evening? Connie and Muriel, welcome. It is after 6.30, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Welcome to tonight's uh, trustee training, 10 things library boards do that hurt your library. I am Mary Beth Schaefer. I am the assistant director and I am joining you tonight from Minnesota. We have Gail Santi. She is the director of CQLS and today is her birthday. And we have Patty Collins and she is a youth services, um, God, I forgot the word consultant for a minute. Youth services consultant. And um, she's, uh, she's gonna be our lead today because she's running the slideshow. We also have a couple other staff members here. So I'm gonna introduce them. And just as I see them on my screen, we have Michael Adamic. He is the Pathfinder manager and the digital librarian. We have Andy Michener. He is the IT manager. We have Loretta Schrader. She is our bookkeeper. We have Peggy. Um, she is our secretary and is that everybody that's here for tonight? I think so. All yeah. right. All right. Um, Patty, why don't you go ahead and start sharing our slideshow just to keep oh, us on track. Okay. I think you have to have this headphones to do this. I want to tell you that um, we can take questions anytime. And so don't hesitate to speak up or to type your question in the chat. If you have a question that you would prefer to keep anonymous, you can direct message either Patty, Gail, Mary Beth, or Andy, or even Michael. And we will answer that question anonymously. And then um, that way you don't have to feel embarrassed or anything like that. We're here to help. One thing before we start that I wanna say is that I was looking over our slides today and um, every single thing that we're gonna talk about is something that has happened in real life in a library, in our, our library in history. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, 10 things library boards do that hurt your library. All right, uh, next slide, please, Patty. Failure, failure to communicate. This um, has many different aspects. Um, failure to communicate with your library, your um, librarian, your board members, or um, it could even be just the basic thing of not coming to your board meeting prepared to um, do board business. Um, Patty, tell us a little bit more about that. And take yourself off mute, please. 
have to do all of those things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know um, I'm demanding <laughs> as a boss. I know <laughs> one of those things that um, you'll find about tonight. Some of those things that you have heard um, bits of before, but you're going to see them in a different light. Um, we, you've often heard us talk about um, that relationship between the board and the librarian it has to be like this um, because the only other option is like this. And that's when we see problems develop in, in the libraries. Um, and um, we'll be very honest with what you'll see tonight. These are all situations that we've seen in libraries um, in, in the CKLS territory. So none of this, um, some of this might not surprise you. This like, oh, hey, that's probably us. Um, because <laughs> and that's okay. It's not to be ashamed of. It's, it's something that's um, really, um, it's really helpful that you can recognize so you can learn and move on. In the failure to communicate, um, we we have that situation where um, a a a board isn't um, isn't talking at all, or the librarian can also be guilty of of not asking, and that has to be a, a two way street. Otherwise, it turns into this situation, and that responsibility is from library director to board chair if it's outside of meeting, but if it's inside of meeting, that's a conversation that happens with everybody that's present in that room. And we'll talk about um, corporate body and who's the boss of who and all those things here in a little bit, but we have to remember that it's everyone's responsibility um, as, as that communication that happens through email between meetings, um, because if you come unprepared, you're gonna spend the entire meeting trying to catch up and right. other people are going to be like, okay, well, I was already there. So um, it's that um, responsibility is, is a, a big part of being a board. It is. It is. I agree. I think that one of the most important communication tools that a library can have is the librarian or the library director's written report to the board every month. So if you're a board member and you're not getting information from the librarian, you're not going to have the information you need to make important decisions that are best for your library and your community. If you'd like to see a better example in a uh, written report from your library director, Mary, that is one of Mary Best's specialties, and she helps um, librarians learn how to write a, just an awesome, awesome report. There's a, there's a, format you can do so it makes sure that you cover the things that you need to without having to reinvent the wheel every month. Another um, key thing to be um, aware of if you're a new librarian there's going to be projects that you're going to be coming into for your library that you're going to be coming into part way and so of course you're going to need to kind of read some of the old minutes beforehand. Uh, you should be able to get a board packet with uh, minutes from at least six months before, I say a year, but at least six months before. But that also means it's on you to ask questions at the meeting when something comes up that you do not understand. Because if you don't ask, they won't, other members won't know that you don't understand it. And I think everybody's been somewhere when somebody comes up, it's like, well, I didn't know, nobody told me. And so, you know, the, the veteran, <laughs> the established trustee tra trustees need to kind of take those newbies under their wing and uh, help explain some of those things. But sometimes you just get too used to all this information that you forget what's new and what people that aren't trustees before don't know. So tr new trustees ask, even, even if you think it's a stupid question, it's not. If you have that question, somebody else does too. So ask, and you can I ask have, your board members or you can bring it to see Kayla. I have one last thing to say on here that I just thought of at this moment is that unfortunately, like with nearly every profession, the library world comes with its own foreign language instead of jargon. And so your library director may be talking about things like Share It and Koha and um, Kansas Library Express and even CKLS, and it might be something that as, as a board member, you might not understand. Don't be afraid to ask, say, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. CKLS has a really cool um, dictionary of terms that has all of these sort of library, library language that'll help you translate that into English and help you get up to speed. And finally, before we leave this topic, I wanna to go back to that library director's report. Um, 
one of the most important things that's in the library director's report has nothing to do with statistics of how many books check out or how many books we bought or how many people came. It's about telling the library story. And recently we had the opportunity to visit with a, a library board and we're talking about it. And, um, and when they realized that telling the story is far more important than the numbers, they understood better what their librarian did, but they understood how their library worked in their community. And so when we, we talk about telling the story, um, it's examples like um, uh, 12 new families found our library this month. That's a story, it has a stat in it, but that's a story that's more important. Or one of those 12 new families that, that visited our library last month um, invited us to come to their home school group to speak. So that's another story that, that came from that little piece of stat that might have been thrown into a board report earlier, but we're looking at, at details in the, that director's report that are beyond how many books checked out. And so if that's what you're getting, or if that's what you're looking for, know that that, that director's report can be much more. And it doesn't have to be a nine pages report. It can fit all on a single page piece of paper. Um, so um, know that, that we can teach that brevity as well as, as a good quality uh, report. Number two, unclear, undisclosed expectations. This one is tough. Uh, because it leaves everybody feeling um, insecure about what they're doing. And frustrated. <laughs> because you'll have the people who think their things are not going to get done, and so they'll take everything on, and then they become angry because nobody else is doing any work. Or you might have the one person who is not someone who steps right up, they're a great supporter, or they're waiting for something to be delegated to them so they can get it done. Um, or everybody just sits around and looks at each other. Is that, you know, you, you can think of any number of scenarios within a family dynamic where this just creates real havoc. You don't want to come to your first evaluation for your new director. And we recommend a one, um, a review six months in for your new director and then an annual one after that. Mm -hmm. But you don't want your director to come to their evaluation and listen to the board tell them every misstep that they've made or every missed opportunity. And this is the first time they've heard about that opportunity. Also with any kind of value, employment evaluation, no, no, there should be no surprises. They're gonna right. know these are the things I need to work on already. And these are the things I'm doing well. And these are, you know, and these are some in between things, some that are okay, but could we do better? Mm -hmm. It should not be any surprises in evaluation. You also, I've also heard of a librarian that, um, I don't think it was in our system, but one that um, was let go and she felt like she never really knew what the board wanted her to do, what wanted right. from her. And I don't even remember what library it is, but she, you know, she felt like they never told me what they wanted from me, but they were very disappointed that I didn't miss, meet expectations. So I, also keep in mind. If, I, I wonder if mind reader was on her um, job ad. Yeah, remember well, nobody and, is a mind reader. And, and that leads to job description. You can't expect somebody to do a job unless the, those um, directions are lined out in a job description. Um, I, I will admit when I came to CKLS nine years ago, um, the probably at least half of our libraries didn't have job descriptions of any of any sort. And we've been working hard to help them find a job description that matches their job, which frankly for a lot of them is a solo person in a small library. Uh, but uh, to help them um, to help them write the job that fits their library because this isn't a one size fits all situation. The work that the circulation clerk does at the Great Bend Public Library, is very different even than the circulation clerk at the Salina or the Frank Carlson library, which are all considered big libraries in our system. Um, in the same token, the, the Bison solo librarian and the Lebanon solo librarian jobs are very different just because of geography, size of building, number of people, um, and all of those aspects have to roll into that. Um, but there are some aspects of the job descriptions that are the same and we can help in that process as well. When you look at the one of the things to remember is that, sorry, Patty, I'm talking over you. One of the things to remember is that 
a job ad is not a job description. I think that trustees are often very surprised when they prepare a comprehensive job description that describes everything the librarian does. They're actually really surprised by what the librarian does and what they have to deal with on a daily basis. What are your feelings about the job description line? Other duties as assigned. I think that unfortunately it's something that needs to be there, but I also, because things pop up, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, but I also think that um, like library policies, a job description should be as clear as possible. Now, to me, a library, a library policy is how the lib or how the lab board wants the library to be done, and the process is how it gets done. The procedure is what actually gets it done in steps. And so a job description is much like that policy. It's broad and overreaching. And then the procedure, the day-to-day -day work, is not always going to be in that job description. It might just say, does interlibrary loan? It might not give the step-by-step -step process on how interlibrary loan is done. But things in our profession change so rapidly that you almost always have to have other, other duties as assigned. And I but think it's a good I, rule of, go ahead. I also think that the board needs to be very realistic about those other duties. If you want a librarian who writes a lot of grants because your funding is insecure and you wanna make sure you have more grant, grant money available, you better be realistic about how much time your librarian has to do that um, and what might not happen if that librarian is busy writing grants because that's not something that you just sit down and write a book report for. That is a comprehensive project. And I think it's a good, um... Good idea to keep in mind that uh, you need to update this these job descriptions because um, other duties as assigned something may pop up but then it becomes a routine part of your mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. daily routine so then it could be added into your job describe this job description there's going to be some other duties as assigned that only pop up once or twice so they really don't need to you know they still fall into that random mm -hmm. miscellany category but there's others that um, should be added in as you update your job description and then things will fall off as well. As trustees, some of you might have a job description, some of you may not, um, but in uh, the um, um, trustee handbook that uh, Mary Beth has arranged to um, arrive at each of their libraries, um, there are some examples of, of the duties of the librarian and the duties of the um, library of trustees. And um, you'll find out that some of those things overlap um, but some of those things are just board responsibilities and some mm -hmm. of things are um, director responsibilities. Um, when you'll, you'll also notice that um, in um, the, the roadmap for the library is a clear mission and vision. And if you haven't started there or if the mission and vision that you have feel like, feel like you need some retooling, um, again, we can, we can provide some guidance there, but ultimately um, the actual words do come down to a cooperation between the library board of trustees and the librarian to figure out what the roadmap is for your library. It may look very similar in word to from Prairie View to Lebanon, but they mean, may mean completely different things depending on mm -hmm. the town that you're in. Right, and we have a great little handy dandy cheat sheet for writing up um, a mission and vision statement. It makes it real easy. They should be short and succinct and this, this um, tool really helps with that. And that's what Gail always says. Gail always says it should fit on the back of a T-shirt or fit on a pencil. So keep that in mind if your if your library mission is three paragraphs long. <laughs> Time for an update. Wah, Number wah. three. This, <laughs> this is, is the big one, one that hurts. <laughs> this is a really big one. Um, we just talked about job descriptions and that that is important. It is important for the librarian to have a job description and for the trustees to understand the role that they play as well. And as Patty said before, the best libraries are run with a, a relationship like this, where the librarian knows their work and the trustees know their work and they work together. When those roles are not clearly defined, that's when you come to loggerheads. That's also when you'll have this going on, and that's the micromanaging. Um, what you're hiring when you're hiring a librarian 
is you're hiring the chief executive officer for your library. When you think about that, it can really change your perspective on your library director. They are the chief executive officer of your library. You need to understand that they'll be trained well and they will be held to expectations and various different library board members. In the beginning, the library director will appreciate them popping in and checking in on them. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Hey, I've got a question about this. Oh, we can talk about it at the board meeting. That is very much appreciated when you're a new library director. But after a few months, you hit your stride. You start to understand. You've been trained by CKLS. Um, you build a network of librarians in your area and you know who to call when you have a problem. And so popping in every day after the first few months starts to be burdensome. Or after the first few years, Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some places it does happen. Yes. So, it does. Um, so Gail, what's wrong with that sentence popping into the library and telling the director what to do? When we talk about corporate body that will become very clear, but I'll give you a cheat sheet right now is that remember that no one trustee is the librarian's boss. All of the trustees together form what's called a corporate body and that corporate body together are the librarian's boss. One person popping in to tell the librarian what to do jeopardizes the public trust and it also jeopardizes that trustee's position. As a corporate body, a library board can be sued, but not as individuals. When a trustee steps out of that role and acts as an individual, like the one person popping in to say, do this and had, did you remember to do that and do this and do that? That person is opening themselves up to a lawsuit. Um, what you as a trustee might see as being helpful can be seen as being micromanaging. And if you're a grumpy kind of a person by nature, it could especially be seen as creating a hostile work environment or if you're not always careful with the words you choose, it could be seen as creating a hostile work environment. And then you're gonna open yourself up as an individual to a lot of HR problems. I work for two library boards. So I have a whole bunch of bosses and I would as a director not be able to get anything done if I had people popping in all the time to tell me what to do because I would be racing from this to that, to this, to that. I'd be doing this and then I'd try the other thing. I really would get nothing done. Um, science has proven that humans really aren't good at multitasking, that we're much better at unitasking, staying on task. Um, and uh, you're hiring adults and they should know how to manage their time. We'll work with them on project management. They will communicate to the board through their director's report, verbal and written. And, uh, Micromanaging is one of the worst things that you can do. We've seen more than a handful of librarians quit because they felt they were being micromanaged. And these were exceptional people who were gonna be great librarians on down the road. You, as a board member, it, it may be really hard to, because there's always the manager type that's like, how do you know your employee is doing what you need to do if you're not there all the time? However, you have hired this person in a director management position to run the library as, uh, as the board sees fit, that you have developed policies to guide that librarian, mm -hmm. you have developed bylaws which guide the board, and you are, you're, you are putting the trust in this librarian, but by doing that, you're letting your librarian um, spread his or her wings and provide the service that your library needs. Um, you cannot have several people trying to rule the library so to speak mm -hmm. it needs to be the director in charge and then you're in charge of the director and when you hire them you're going to hire somebody that you can trust to do the day-to-day -day so that you as the board can can look at the big picture can mm -hmm. think about the big things can and she's gonna or she or he is gonna worry about the day-to-day um, nitty gritty stuff and you get to you get to see the forest and she gets to see the trees one of the and things I think that we also need, Mary Beth touched on policies. 
And one of the things that we've become aware of is that outside of the bigger libraries, most libraries don't have a personnel policy. And I see that as um, a problem. And so we're working on, on that uh, to come up with some short and sweet uh, personnel policies to be able to have people start from. Um, if you don't have a personnel policy, your employees don't know what's expected of them as far as behavior, clothing, um, days off. What do they do if they get sick and they can't come into the library? What do they do if their car breaks down on the way to work? Who do they call? What do they do? Those are the things that become very clear in a personnel policy. And if you've got that in place, that alleviates a whole bunch of trouble, a whole bunch of headaches. I because all of the board knows. Mm -hmm. Mary Beth did a super job by, by explaining the forest and the trees. And it's all of those little things like in that, that last portion of this slide that's talking about the the program and the book title and those things. If you joined the board thinking those were the things that, that were going to be your responsibility that you were going to have the input on, then you want to go find a job as a library director. Yes, there's some input there. And certainly if there are questions, if there's a, an issue of a program um, that's too costly or it might create some, um, some chatter in your community, I'll just mm -hmm. say it that way, um, then, then the, of course those would be what to be conversations that you would want to have at a board meeting to talk about the direction for your library. But um, I, I think that, that that's the first time that we've said it that way. And, and those day-to-day -day details are the responsibility of the librarian. Yeah. Going along with micromanaging is failure to trust. Um, this one is, is probably the scariest on the list because none of us want to be that person that's guilty of, of not trusting. You'll see the first thing listed here is, is um, key control. Uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. who are on a board just think in a small town, well, I'm just going to get keys to the library to do with as I please. And um, uh, keeping a, a limited number of keys to the library building for specific purposes is the ideal situation. Um, you know, those should be signed out to individuals, not just given out. CKLS puts over $30,000 worth of library materials into your library every year through the rotating book collection. It's your responsibility to keep those things safe and secure. Um, your computers cost money. Every individual book is about $25 to $35. Um, you may have petty cash as well. You should have a limited number of keys and those keys should be signed out to individuals. And when those individuals leave their association with the library, those keys need to be turned in. Unfortunately, we find um, there may be people who've been off the board for 10 years, they still have a key to the library and they come in and use the library whenever they want to or library supplies. Um, that is a really bad practice. You're running a business in your library. You're hiring a chief executive officer. If you have a hospital in your town, they couldn't run the hospital if everybody had a key willy-nilly. Also, as part of that um, control of things, the other is, is being impeding the librarian's ability to be able to take care of the daily running of the business. Mm -hmm. And that means um, being able to run to the local grocery and buy you know, um, a roll of toilet paper <laughs> um, or cleaning supplies. Um, it might be um, the arrangement to pay the electric bill and the telephone and the internet bills ahead of time, making sure As that- As they come due. So, so they're not constantly overdue because they're waiting for a board meeting. Um, so you don't want that against you, but um, allowing um, allowing the librarian to make some of the business decisions um, is an important part of, of the librarian's job. Mm -hmm. and, and that goes also with when a library might see a need that just popped up. So let's take, for instance, the pandemic, because it's right in our midst still is the librarian would see a need that she needs to buy cleaning supplies and she needs a different kind than what you have in stock because it doesn't meet the CDC requirement. Uh, the librarian should be allowed to be able to 
make that decision and at least purchase some of it before a bigger purchase could be made. So think about what petty cash you have on hand and think about also if um, a prepaid credit card or debit card is the way to go so that we can make some of those purchases online if you can find a better deal or if there's not a local option available. Every um, librarian should know how much they can spend without board approval. Depending on your library budget, it could be as much as $10,000, although I really doubt it. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, it just depends on your budget and things like that, but a librarian should not have to wait until the next board meeting to ask to buy ink for the printer. Or um, there is a leak problem under the sink and now there's mold and she needs to take care of it immediately or you had a big program or just a regular story time program and you had a lot more kids show up than what you planned for. So you need to go and get a few more supplies. Yeah. Those should all follow under the realm of day-to-day -day business decisions. Right. Gail, um, when it snows six inches in Great Bend, or do you have the, the opportunity or the responsibility to close the library at your discretion? No, I don't because we have a policy for emergency weather and inclement weather situations. Now, if, so when the school district closes, the library closes. But this last, this year, the school district was closed for most of the year. So when we had snow, I did then have the permission of the board to make a decision to close the library because the school district couldn't close or if there's bad weather in the summer yes i do and i know exactly what i do when that happens if our sewer starts stinking because it's an old building or if it smells like gas leak everywhere the director should have full power to say okay i'm calling it this is an unsafe place to be i want everybody to go home we put signs up everywhere i'll call the board chair and let them know and that would go for any kind of emergency thing mm -hmm. um your hvac goes out yeah there's some kind of issue in the community where you need to leave the building so um the librarian should have the authority to make those um immediate decisions where it's not you can't have a special board meeting to decide it the librarian no, should be allowed to do that i will also say that even though i am who i am um as probably especially because I am who I am at the next board meeting in my report, I let the board know that we closed and why and what led to that judgment call. And that's good too, because that could lead to discussion about if there needs to be a policy in place. Exactly right. Exactly Sometimes right. you can't have a policy for everything, but um, you're going to know if a situation uh, merits one and, and usually it's going to be something that could be a repetitive issue right and you heard me call it a judgment call um, I'm editing some policies these days as I'm prone to do and um, it just makes my my hair curl when I see that they've written something up that's to the discretion of the librarian I don't think that anything should be left up to their discretion it should be left up to their judgment they are well trained they understand their community and they're going to use that basis to make a sound decision. And trust me, we've gotten calls from librarians who say, oh, I don't know if I should close because of this or that. And we help walk them through that decision making process. You'll also There's nothing notice discretionary that, about it. Sorry. You'll also notice that Gail said that when that um, opportunity necessitates that she must make this decision, she makes the decision. And then she reaches out to the board chair. So they also know what's going on in case they happen to be in Walmart or, or the, mm -hmm. the local quick shop. And, and somebody says, well, why is the library closed? They're, they're educated, but that goes back to that very first slide of communicating between the two ends. Yep. This is the best it. birthday party ever. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll touch the basis a little bit more on that last point there. Um, I guess we've moved on to the next one, but I just wanted to touch point when your librarian does a financial report or helps with the financial report. Uh, most likely we're going to touch on the key points and it's your job as the board to kind of know that financial report and have questions available, but you shouldn't have to go over every financial decision or line item on your bank statement 
because most of them are going to be recurring ones that you should know about. And then she'll point out ones that she thinks are important, but have your questions for the ones that you don't recognize and pay attention to them and look for any irregularity should there be one. But yes. that's a lot different than questioning every single, every single purchase on. Absolutely right. This is a favorite of mine. Um, Kansas law says you have to pay your librarian minimum wage. There's been a lot in the news about minimum wage lately. Um, and we know that in libraries that are open less than 20 hours a week, it's not uncommon for the library to be that director's third job um, just so they can make enough money to live and not have benefits on any of those. Uh, the Kansas Public Library standards say you should spend at least 60% of your operating money should be spent on personnel. Um, and I know that there are libraries here who have a very small operating budget. And they say, well, if we spend money on our library director, we wouldn't be able to do this, this, and this. And I say to you, if you didn't have a well-paid library director, you wouldn't be able to do that anyway. If you don't have a well-paid library director, there's nobody to buy the books, to buy the right ones for your community, nobody to help patrons find those materials, to point patrons to materials, the digital library that is so amazing, um, to be able to help people find the answers to their questions. The most important part of any library are the employees. In my opinion, the board's number one job is to take care of those employees and that means paying them well. A lot of times boards are reluctant to pay librarians well because they have a misunderstanding about what the librarians do. They think the librarian is there to babysit the books, that story time is nothing more than reading a story to some children. Um, and that's why we haul all the way back to that job description, because when you find out that your librarian is responsible for uh, submitting a report upon which all of your additional funding from CKLS in the state hinges, look at that dollar amount that's coming in because that librarian's doing their job. When your librarian is supposed to be familiar with state and federal library laws, that's something that a babysitter doesn't know. Your librarian is a highly trained professional and they have to be very um, technical in their knowledge and they have to be um, highly skilled in technology as well. That's not a babysitter of the books. And your librarian has to be um, the face of the library. Okay. They're going to have the interaction with the public. They're going to be customer service. They're going to be public relations. Right. They may also, your librarian may also be your accountant. I know several librarians mm -hmm. that have to run the books as well. Right. And there's a treasurer there that, you know, looks over and verifies, but they're the ones that actually run it. And right. think of all those other administrative tasks that your librarian needs to do. Um, if you've got patron behavior policies that talk about how you have to kick a, a subperson out of the library and what they've done. Um, those are there for a reason. Those are responsibilities that, you're, that fall to your librarian. One of the things, the last bullet here, I'll really touch base on. When a, a new librarian comes to a library, CKLS sends out not more than six different, not less than, sorry, six different people who spend at least half a day with that librarian to train that librarian. And then they spend a great amount of time mentoring that librarian through telephone and email follow-up visits. Um, each one of those six visits is a highly technical visit on an entirely different subject. There is a lot of learning. And if you think that um, CKLS does not take this lightly, we have an exceptional new librarian training program. We, we are the ones that the rest of the state looks at and says, wow, how do we do that? We need that, which is just great. Um, but it is it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to train someone new. And if you're paying a living wage and you're making sure that the rest of things in this slideshow don't happen, the cost of training that person goes down each day they're in the library, each day they stay. 
Yeah, your librarian um, is a manager. Your librarian is in charge of the, the health and well-being and safety of their patrons while they're in that building. So they're the ones that have to take charge should an emergency arise. Mm -hmm. Your librarian <laughs> is in charge of so much. Um, and then if you do have um, additional staff, your frontline staff are in charge of that everyday face of the library. Um, conflict resolution when there's an angry patron or, you know, diffusing a situation between two angry patrons that are after each other. Um, you know, if you've ever worked customer service or frontline staff, a cashier or anything, you know the kind of the kind of interactions that you deal with day to day. And if um, you can't, if your staff are getting minimum wage for that kind of interaction, but they can make a higher wage for, you know, somewhere else, they're going to go and you're going to lose good people. Mm -hmm. You're going to lose the people that are going to be the best fit for your library because, you know, they have to go what's going to help support them and their families. In my dream world, library staff make equivalent to what city staff makes. In Great Bend, I would be equivalent to the zookeeper. I don't have tigers, mind you, but I do have patrons who sometimes act like wild beasts. Um, my managers would be making the equivalent of what um, the roads crew manager makes. And my circulation staff would certainly be making every bit as much as any other administrative staff in the city. Because the duties and responsibilities, while they're different, they're very similar. And if you take nothing else away from this, this evening, this training, bear this in mind is that consider how much you're paying your librarian and all the responsibilities they have. And if you can't think of any way to wiggle your library budget to pay the librarian more, why don't you give us a call and we'll be glad to come out and help you work on that. As we leave this discussion, the one thing that gets hidden on the librarian job description is the technical advisor to the library board. Yes. They are the ones who send that communication of trainings of like tonight. They're the ones who make sure that you understand the new library law that's, that's going to ultimately affect your library. They're the ones that have been professionally trained and are um, sharing with you the things that are important for you as a trustee um, to know to be able to do your job as a trustee. It's a good point, Patty. Poor meeting this, management. <laughs> this one you have heard from us in, in different ways if you've been to Trustee Basics because we do spend a lot of time talking about this one. Um, and, but, the, but Gail's favorite is the top one and so it moved to the top. I, it only, is. It not is. Not only um, adopting a, a consent agenda but also <laughs> following it. Right. Gail, what does that mean? Well, the, the, one of the reasons that this is important to me is I have a military background. And so, you know, you, these poor people have to put up with that all the time, but efficiency is a big part of that. If you were told when you were recruited for the library board that you would just have to attend one meeting a month and that would be it. Well, by for now, an yeah, an hour, um, by now you may have realized that's not quite all there is to it. Um, but I regularly attend library board meetings that drag on for two or three hours. Um, that is, unless there's a big situation going on, that's really not necessary. Um, if you've got a tight agenda and you follow a consent agenda, your meetings aren't ever gonna last more than an hour unless you've got an unusual situation going on. So a consent agenda is something that the board adopts and it requires some black backward planning. So, you know, and I always use the Thanksgiving example because it works so well. If you want dinner on the table at five, you know, the bird's got to come out of the oven at four because it's got to sit before you carve. And so what time do we have to have the bird in? Then what time do we have to have defrosting? A consent agenda is much the same. You want your board members to have their entire board packet a week before the meeting. And so if your meeting is on the first Monday of the month, they need to have their packet to them on the last Monday of the month. So you're going to kind of adjust what the month looks like for, a, for the report in the packet. It might be from the first to the 20th, 
and then you're going to catch the 20th to the first step the next time and it's just going to roll over like that you're never going to leave any time out. The reason you want your board members to get that packet a week before is because they should sit down and they should take anywhere from a half an hour to an hour it depends on the size of your packet. Um, and they should look over that packet. They should get out their highlighter and their pen and they should highlight things and ask questions, write questions down on their board packet. Um, they might need to do a little bit of research. If you are um, trying to decide if your library should try to get a credit card or if you should get a prepaid um, gift card or a visa card or a debit card, as a board member, you may wanna do a little bit of research and find out what's gonna be best for our library. What's allowable? What are we gonna be able to get? And those things need to happen outside of the meeting. So if you're the board chair and you're running the meeting, realize that probably everybody's already spent an hour on the packet. So you get to the meeting, you adopt the consent agenda, ask for any questions or discussion. And if there are none, then you move on. Um, and what's so on that, what's in that board packet, Gail? Okay, so in the board packet, the first thing is an agenda. The best agendas are made with the board chair and the library director working together um, because they both are gonna have input into that. As a library director and as the um, CKLS system librarian is my new title I'm calling myself this week. Um, I always sit right next to the board president because we're a team, a very close team and we work together and um, we can whisper things back and forth like, oh, now how should I request this movement motion or something like that? Or I can say, oh, we need to go back. We forgot this. So it's the agenda. It's going to have the written report from the director. It will have, if you've got a larger librarian, you have a youth services librarian or a children's librarian, they may write a report. Um, complete financials will be in there. Um, mention of anything, like any sort of communications that came in, um, those kinds of things. It was old business, new business, those sorts of things. Um, you may or may not allow for public comment on the agenda. You don't have to let anybody talk. And even if you do decide to let people talk, you don't have to let them talk forever. You can say public comment will take five public comments no longer than five minutes each and they have to be on topic of the agenda. Some meetings go on overly long because they think they have to let people talk and you don't. Um, because every town has that one person whose voice is so important that they have to talk for 10 minutes at every meeting. Um, so the Kansas Open Meetings Act allows for not letting people talk. So um, they do the consent agenda and then you move on to new business. You could also as an agenda item have training and um, decide that your library trustees want to become better about promoting the library out in the community. And so you work on that for a few meetings and you practice um, getting everybody up to speed and what's our elevator speech going to be and stuff like that. Planning is a crucial part of a library trustees position. You need to plan for the future. Um, and if you have a time in there for planning, it happens. If it's like a savings account. If you don't pay yourself first, it's not gonna happen. You need to plan and you need to make time to plan. Of course, in the, in, and I saw Pam wrote in there, you're gonna have the minutes to approve from the last meeting and things like that. All of those regular sorts of things. Planning is very important. Um, and by planning, I don't mean who's gonna bake the brownies and who's gonna make the Rice Krispie squares for the um, bake sale that we're gonna hold for a fundraiser. I mean, the big stuff. We know that our computers are this many years old. We've talked to Andy. We know we're gonna need to replace them in two years. How are we gonna budget for that? How are we gonna find the money for that? Are we gonna write grants for that? Who's gonna do it? If we expect our librarian to write the grant, have we made sure that that director is trained to do that? Um, what trends do we see happening? Where do we want our library to be? How can we move our library forward? That's the big work of a trustee. The big work is not hashing over the financials and the minutes, meeting after meeting after meeting. One of the reasons that it's hard to get library trustees is because traditionally library meetings are very boring. 
That's the reason they call it a board meeting, in my opinion. We just spell it wrong. You can make your meetings lively and exciting, and you actually can make your meetings run so well that people hear about them and they'd like to serve on your library board. I, I believe that that can happen. Um, Patty, we have about 10 minutes left. What number are we on? Um, we're moving to seven. Yeah. Okay. The unengaged and uninvolved board. This is a little opposite to some of the things that Gail was sharing. Um, some of these things won't surprise you at all. Um, but when you look at number four, trustees missing multiple meetings without good reason. Mary Beth, would you like to talk about library trustees missing meetings and what can you do? All right, so of course it's frustrating when a, a trustee um, is a regular absentee. Um, it, you, it's hard to make move forward when you don't have all the input that you need and all the manpower, staff power that you need to get there. Um, you cannot, however, force a board trustee to resign. You can strongly encourage them, maybe come to their door with a pre-written letter for them to resign. You can explain to them that with you missing all these meetings, we struggle to meet quorum, which you cannot do any business meeting without meeting quorum. And if you cannot make these meetings, would you please give up your seat so that we can find somebody that can so we can do library business. It does not need to be contentious. Yes, you do have to um, be direct and be firm with them, but that doesn't mean it has to be contentious. It can just be straightforward, compassionate. I understand that this is a challenge for you to meet these, make these meetings. Would you be willing to give up your seat so we can find somebody who can make these meetings and work for the library? And then of course, you know, leave it open for them. We would love for you to come volunteer for the library. If your schedule changes and we will be able to give more time, you know, make those possibilities if you really would like them to come back on the board. Don't leave that, don't leave that possibility up there if, you, if it's time for them to be off the board and it's time for them to find something different. We've got a great- Is it a law or a local rule that if you miss two consecutive meetings, you need to be replaced? That would be a local rule and it's not enforceable. You cannot have a board member resign. You can say if they meet, I would say two consecutive meetings is too strict. There's yes. going to be things where you are going to miss two consecutive meetings. Um, somebody could be sick for that long or have a family member sick for that long. Mm -hmm. um, usually, I would say three unexcused consecutive meetings would be my bare minimum. But again, you cannot force them to quit. They would have to resign themselves. And the city cannot force a board member to, re to quit either. That is why it's so important for your city mayor to appoint and your city council to approve that appointment because that's their input. That's giving your board the power to do what it needs to, but that's them vetting those choices. So if they, <laughs> if they are uncertain about somebody, this is where that decision-making comes in because once somebody's on the board, they cannot be removed right. without their, Mary I Beth, mean, they can remove themselves, but they cannot be removed by somebody else. Mary Beth pointed out the um, third point on the triangle that we've not talked about. We've been talking about the library director. We've talked about the library board, but the third point of that triangle is the city or the township board, that governing body um, that um, um, that is the the those who appoint and approve those um, library trustees. Um, if you don't have a relationship with your city, or if you have a contentious relationship with your city, at some point, both the library director and the library board of trustees are going to have to deal with the situation. It's just inevitable, and so it's going to be maybe swallowing a little crow or maybe being a little nicer to somebody after church that you might not necessarily be um, because as a library trustee, you are a public figure now. And um, that comes with um, all the responsibilities and um, the accolades, but it also comes with some of the headaches. And so um, in, in a small town, we are very guilty of thinking we know everybody very well and we know what they're thinking and what they're doing. And that kind of leads to the very last line on our slide tonight that um, uh, if, you're, if you're in it for the wrong reason, somebody's gonna figure that out pretty quickly. 
even if you're up, even if you're not in a small town, um, if you're there for um, to have a position but to not really um, participate, um, somebody's going to call you out. Um, as we've already said, you, you can't make them leave. But that that um, last line um, has been used a lot. Um, a former um, uh, member of the, the State Library of Kansas um, team used to use it to remind us that sometimes that's the um, building um, builder libraries one obituary at a time. Um, because sometimes that um, the the person who's the um, obstinate figure um, has to get out of the way at some point so the librarian and the board can move forward and do their work. Let's talk money. Woo. Take us to our next slide. Financial mistakes. Um, it, is the these, board, it is the board's responsibility to procure funding for the library, first off. There are laws that support a board in doing that. And there are also laws that say what you can and cannot do with money. Um, so, so here's some of the downfalls of, of, in finances that we see with boards. One that's very concerning to us is in this situation where um, the director is expected to make um, purchases for library, whether it's books or uh, materials or um, things to run the library, as we mentioned, um, cleaning supplies or, or things of that nature. I'm expected to make those purchases with their personal money and then expect to get reimbursed. Um, on the other side of the coin, We've actually been in library board meetings where um, uh, there is a visitor and where a library trustee will walk in and said, I bought this book, hands it to the librarian and says, okay, you guys owe me $28.12. Without conversation about who's doing selection, but also it gets down to, there are ways that the library director knows to save money. And it's not necessarily on the whim of the board member who happened to be in an airport and spent $28 on a library book and now all of a sudden wants to get paid back for it. That's not good library practice or good library business. The person who does the day-to-day -day job of running the library is the librarian. Um, and then that very last one, spending money on non-library items. Uh, recently, um, Gail got a call and was asked if the library could donate money to, was it um, funding a park? It um, was um, it was for a family in need. It was for uh, raising money for a family in need. And while that's a very altruistic goal, any money given to the library must be spent on library things. It cannot go any further than that. It has to stay with the library and that's in, that's in Kansas statutes. So, and, so for that situation, I would say the board members can make personal donations to that cause, but the library could not. Right. A fundraiser and, and, could be held at the library. Yeah. And in that similar situation, um, we, we were asked about um, donating to um, adding playground equipment to a park. And the condition, the situation was, well, we're part of the city. Um, well, if the city wants to build a park, they have a parks and rec or they have finances to do that, but that's not um, where library money goes. And so those are two kind of extreme examples, but you, know, you can probably think of a handful of things that wouldn't be library things. And you can think of a lot of things that are library things. And one thing that um, often people look down on are the things of like providing food for a program or providing craft materials for a program. In the case where your um, library programs are too costly, you can ask um, attendees to uh, register ahead of time and pay for materials for an event. That is perfectly okay. They can't pay to take the class they're paying for materials mm -hmm. so and it would and it should be the actual cost of the materials um you're, you're not going to make a profit because you are a nonprofit public library right. Um, right. also so, keep in mind that the public library falls under cash basis law which means that the library cannot go into debt so if you have board members purchasing things and expecting to be reimbursed without any um discussion with the rest of the library board direct or director you could fall into trouble because yes. there's not the money there to reimburse the director or if the director or reimburse the board member 
or if the director is purchasing on a personal card for the library and then there's not library funds to to the library reimburse. couldn't pay for that interest that might accrue on that card yes. we've just got a couple more minutes let's go on to our last slides I'm expecting special privileges. This list won't surprise you necessarily um, because we may, um, each of us may be guilty of one of those, um, that, it's, that special privileges um, comes up with library staff as well. Particularly number three, no fines or fees. Mm -hmm. um, I was standing at a CERC desk once as a fairly new employee and I sent the board member to go get her $1.28 in fines and one of my, Frankly, one of my clerks who actually worked for me says, she doesn't have to pay. And I'm like, why not? I read the policy book. It said nothing about it. I was the one who made the faux pas. The board member went out, got her $1.28. And she says, I guess I should have been paying these all along. And there was never yes. a question any longer. Yes. Um, it's rare that in library policy, uh, a board will put that the board doesn't have to pay fines and fees. And if it's not in policy, um, it's, it's the rule and it, it should be adhered to. Um, library board members often come in and say, I want you to buy this book and I want to be the first person to get it. That's not cool. That's not cool. That is, that is taking advantage of your position and libraries hold, and especially library board members hold public trust. And when you expect these special privileges or when your board members are getting these, they're getting privileges above and beyond the people who are paying for the library, above and beyond the patrons, and that ruins that public trust. The last no two one, is just so the, concerning the, to me. Yeah, the big one to me is the last one, using the library after hours. Um, you can't run a secure building and keep your goods secure if people are in after hours. Now, lots of us have programs after hours, but nobody should be in the library after hours unless it's somebody doing the cleaning or maybe the, the treasurer is, is gathering up the financials and things like that, but they've already told somebody that they're gonna be there and they're gonna work on it then. That way somebody knows. Those should all have checks and balances. Yes. I need to go in after the library to pick this up. So you told somebody going in just to pick out a book because you read, you know, you the last book you checked out was so good. You read it in one night and you need another one and you're just going to pop over to the library and I'll pick one out. And then the librarian can check it out the next day. That is, that's crossing that line. Yeah. And that's, um, I'm going to use it. I'm going to say exploiting your, your privileges as a board mm -hmm. member. It's exploiting. And, and that goes back to the key control from an, an earlier slide. Gail has already touched on this one quite a lot. This is usually where we start basic trust, trustee training is the, the description of the corporate body. Um, Gail has mentioned public trust. Um, the one that we haven't mentioned so far is lose credibility with the library director. If you mm -hmm. think um, it works on both sides, the library director loses credibility by her patrons um, or his patrons, but also it goes in that that same um, trust relationship between the library director and the and the the board and and you know we we talked about not trusting your library director, but it also goes the other way because if your library director doesn't feel like they can trust their or library respect. board or respect if their board is constantly working outside of the law or outside of their own bylaws. It's very easy for a library director to lose respect for their board. And that's difficult. That's really hard to overcome. And it often, if I go into a situation like that, the next day, usually three or four people have resigned from the board um, just because it's hard to hear. And that's, that's just not something I want anybody to see. And so that's why we have this here. It's important. And if you know it going in, it's really easy. You know, if you look back at all of these, these slides, it's really acting like a really good, decent human being who wants the best for the library and the community. And if you just bear that in mind, you're going to do a great job. That was tip number 10, but of course we are overachievers. So there of <laughs> course is a bonus clue. And the words that you hear us all say all the time, it all comes down to policy. Yes. Better to write effective and lawful policies and bylaws. Bylaws are the rules that govern the work that you do as trustees. 
the policies or the rules that your patrons live by and, and um, allow them the opportunity to use the library. Those policies that the uh, patrons abide by are written in conjunction with the library board. Yes. The library director, of course, has a lot of input because they know what the day looks like. But um, the library board um, knows from their training and from um, library best practices, the kinds of things that should appear in those policies, but it is a cooperation. Um, if there are other staff, they're also involved because if you have a children's librarian or a technical services librarian, they know what the, the procedures are for interlibrary loan. So then that helps them inform to write the best policy. So um, you'll notice that it says effective and lawful policies. There, I'm are, working lot, now. Yeah. there are a lot of policies that we have seen that are truly against the law. One of the things that CKLS does is we offer policy edits and I'm working right now with, I think with three libraries to help them clean up their policies. And one of the things that Mary Beth and I have been talking about, and I think I just finished it today, Mary Beth, is a set of policies that would require very little customization by most of the libraries in CKLS. And so we're gonna test this out. And if it, it works well, it's something that we'll be able to hand to people who say, we know our policies are a mess, but we don't even know where to start. What can you do for us? We know we need these 10 policies, but we don't know what's supposed to be in them. And so it's, a, it's something that we're working on now. It says, here, start here, start here. These are things that are gonna hold up in a court of law. These are things that aren't gonna get you in trouble. Um, just, just things like that. And because it's not easy to know all of the library law, attorney general's opinions and Kansas administrative regulations and HR law and federal HR law and employment labor laws and things like that. But those are the things that need to be reflected in your policies. And we're really here to help with that. Mary Beth, could you tell us a little bit what's on the CKLS LibGuides? Yes, um, on the CKLS LibGuides, we do have, well, we have a trustee training resource guide and it has um, the trustee training manual and, the, and all that and some pre-filled forms, gap waiver. And then we also have a, a sample library policies LibGuide. And this one has um, sample policies for patron behavior or computer use or collection management or donations. Um, we don't have a lot of personnel policies up yet, but we are working on it. Yeah. And so if you go to the CKLS website um, and go to the right-hand column, there's resource guides and you can find it there. Um, or email me for it and I can send you a link directly to it. Um, but it has a lot of sample policies. They're ready to download and you put your name in where it says library name in brackets and <laughs> you know go through them go. change the wording where you need to so it fits your library's needs and then put on the date approved and you're good to go so we've tried to simplify it as much as possible thank you trust um andy put the link in the in the chat there um, for you, trustee andy. training andy can you do the one for the sample policies as well please um Download it, customize it to your library, and approve it. it and ask for help. It should be that simple. Ask and ask for help. help. We can do a deep edit where we, you know, we look at content, we look at grammar and punctuation and all that stuff, but we also look at content and enforceability, um, law-abiding policies. <laughs> um, so we look at it from many different angles, um, so that it's a policy that you can enforce. Yeah. but also a policy that's going to serve your library well. Yes. Library trustees are most valuable volunteers in the state and Kansas thinks so, thinks this, and you can tell that they think this because they have statutes that govern library trustee work. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're in charge of public funds that are coming in to serve your library's needs and that puts you in public trust. You are doing great things. And we all know that everybody here has the same goal in mind. And that is to make your public library the best public library that it can be. Thanks um, yes. for joining us tonight. If really you have any questions, please put them in the chat now. 
or um i'm gonna move spotlight so i can see everybody again mm -hmm. um or put them in the chat now unmute yourself and ask or send it in an email if you're not comfortable doing it in this form forum you can private chat us here or um send us an email we will um get back to you as soon as you can um, I will note that I am on vacation and have limited <laughs> email access when I am out on the lake. So vacation. if you want an emergency, if you want, um, if your issue is urgent, please contact Gail or Patty, yes. but I will get um, to you next week. We've run over a little bit, but I want to thank you for joining us again. One of the things that I want to put out to you is a call for help. If you've been attending trustee trainings year after year and you'd like to hear new topics or you have topics that are of concern to you and things that you'd like to learn more about, we would really appreciate it if you would get in touch with us. Um, these trustee trainings are for you. We do the very best we can to bring ideas that we think will be beneficial to you and to help you learn how to grow in your role as a trustee. But if you've got something, let us know. And we can always come to your library and do an individualized training for your library board as well. And, and thank you for joining us again. And don't think of that request as, as punitive or that you're doing something wrong. Sometimes you need somebody else in your room to be the person to give you the fire to keep going. Um, or maybe you've got a big project ahead of you and you're truly not sure um, what the direction is you want to go and need somebody to talk it out. And so it's our pleasure to either um, meet with you on Zoom or physically come to your library board meeting and one or two of us or all three of us might show up depending on what issue is or, or what you need that particular evening and and we're happy to be there and do that it's part of um it makes us feel like real librarians because you are our patrons and mm -hmm. we don't get to see patrons in the same way so the libraries that we serve and their trustees are our patrons so thank you very much i'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording